Bonjour tout le monde. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of being in the wonderful company of Dr. Tam, who is Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, Dr. Nu, who is Deputy Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, also in the wonderful virtual company of Minister Anan, Anita Anan, who is Minister of Public Services and Procurement, as well as in the company of Minister Nadi Baines, who is Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. Dr. Tam, please. Good afternoon, bon après-midi. I'd like to make a few observations today on what we're learning about the long game in the control of COVID-19. But first, here are the latest numbers for COVID-19 in Canada. There have been 101,337 cases, including 8,430 deaths. 63% of the cases have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 2,415,000 people for COVID-19 to date. Over the past week, an average of 38,000 people were tested daily, with 1% testing positive. These numbers change quickly, and you can get the updates in the evenings on canada.ca slash coronavirus. <clears throat> for weeks, we've been looking at our collective progress to slow epidemic growth and get COVID-19 under control. We've still got a few hot spots in Canada, and we'll see more than one new flare-up to remind us that COVID-19 has not gone away. The marathon continues. I wish I could say we were close to the finish line, or even halfway, but that simply isn't the case, and no one can say for sure how far off we are. We've got a very clear motivation to keep going, and there is absolute certainty that giving up is not an option. We've got to work together to get through this. All along the way, we've had countries ahead of and beside us in this marathon, or are doing similar things but with different degrees of success. Contrasts both within Canada as well as globally are teaching us many things about COVID-19 epidemic control. Globally, there are now over 9 million cases, with an average of almost 150,000 new cases being reported every day over the past seven days. And if we think those cases aren't close to home, think again. Almost 60% of these new cases are being reported from the Americas. Summer hasn't made COVID-19 go away. Populations around the world are still highly susceptible, and epidemics can be reignited anywhere at any time. That doesn't mean we don't control our own future here in Canada. On the contrary, with COVID-19 around us, we can't have a reopening that doesn't include all of us working together to keep our guard up and keep the curve down. This is the long game. The first role is to be aware of the risks of exposure and to make informed decisions, taking necessary precautions to keep you and your loved ones safe. Those precautions include keeping the two meters of physical distancing, washing hands often, covering coughs and sneezes, layering with a non-medical mask or face covering, and staying home when sick. And now that spaces are reopening, we need to avoid or strictly limit our time in settings and situations that increase our risk of exposure to the virus, like closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with large numbers of people gathered, and closed contacts where you can't keep the two metres apart from others. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Tam. Dr. Nu? Merci. Bonjour. Aujourd'hui, on aimerait faire quelques observations sur les leçons qu'on tire de longs processus visant à maîtriser la COVID-19. Toutefois, je vais d'abord vous donner les derniers chiffres sur la COVID-19 au Canada. Il y a 101 337 cas confirmés, dont 8 430 décès, et 63 des cas sont maintenant rétablis. À ce jour, des laboratoires de partout au pays ont analysé les tests de dépistage de la COVID-19 de plus de 2 millions 415 000 personnes. Au cours de la dernière semaine, nous avons testé en moyenne 38 000 personnes chaque jour, dont 1 ont reçu un résultat positif. Ces chiffres changent rapidement et sont mis à jour quotidiennement en soirée sur le site canada.ca baroblique le trait d'union coronavirus. Pendant des semaines, Nous avons examiné nos progrès collectifs pour ralentir l'épidémie et maîtriser la COVID-19. Il reste encore quelques points névralgiques au Canada. Il y a eu 
quelques nouvelles éclosions pour nous rappeler que la COVID-19 n'était pas encore éradiquée. La lutte se poursuit. On aimerait pouvoir dire que nous approchons du but ou même que nous sommes mis à, à la mi-lutte, mais ce n'est pas tout simplement, c'est tout simplement pas le cas. Et personne ne peut dire avec certitude où nous nous situons par rapport à la fin. Nous avons toutefois une motivation très claire qui nous incite à poursuivre nos efforts et cette motivation est la certitude absolue que l'abandon n'est pas une option et que nous devons travailler ensemble pour traverser cette période difficile. Tout au long de cette lutte, des pays réussissaient, réussissaient mieux que nous et d'autres connaissaient le même succès. Tous ces pays prennent des mesures similaires, mais connaissent différents niveaux de réussite. Les différences constatées, tant au sein du Canada que mondialement, nous apprennent de nombreuses choses au sujet de la maîtrise de l'épidémie de COVID-19. À l'échelle mondiale, il y a maintenant plus de 9 millions de cas et une moyenne de 150 000 nouveaux cas ont été déclarés quotidiennement au cours des sept derniers jours. Si vous pensez que ces cas se trouvent loin de chez nous, détrompez-vous. Près de 60 des cas, des nouveaux cas, sont déclarés dans les Amériques. L'été n'a pas permis d'enrayer la COVID-19. Les populations partout dans le monde sont encore très vulnérables et des épidémies peuvent réapparaître n'importe quand, n'importe où. Cela ne signifie que nous ne maîtrisons pas notre propre avenir ici au Canada. C'est tout le contraire. En raison de la présence de la COVID-19, il est essentiel pour la réouverture des lieux publics de travailler tous ensemble pour maintenir notre vigilance et maintenir la courbe à la baisse. Voici le plan à long terme. La première règle consiste à être conscient des risques d'exposition et de prendre des décisions éclairées tout en prenant les précautions nécessaires pour assurer votre sécurité et celle de vos proches. Ces pré précautions comprennent les mesures de santé publique éprouvées. Maintenir une distance de 2 mètres des autres personnes, nous laver les mains souvent, nous couvrir le nez et la bouche lorsque nous toussons ou étouillons, porter un masque non médical ou une couvre-visage et rester à la maison si nous sommes malades. En raison de la réouverture des lieux publics, nous devons éviter les lieux et les situations qui augmentent nos risques d'exposition au virus ou limiter le temps que nous y passons, à savoir les endroits clos, mal aérés, les lieux achalandés et les situations qui ne permettent pas de maintenir une distance de 2 mètres des autres personnes. Merci. Merci beaucoup, euh, Dr. Nou. J'aimerais maintenant passer la parole à la ministre Anita Anand. Anita. Thank you so much, Jean-Yves. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello. It has been more than 100 days since the COVID-19 pandemic struck Canada and changed daily life in this country as we know it. Since the beginning, our government has been vigilant in ramping up procurement and distribution of vital equipment needed to fight the virus, supplementing the procurements of provinces and territories. Aujourd'hui, nous nous trouvons dans une situation différente. Les Canadiens ont fait leur part pour aplatir la courbe et nous jetons les bases d'une reprise économique. Le virus continue de faire des ravages dans beaucoup de régions du monde et nous savons que les progrès réalisés ici jusqu'à maintenant n'auraient pas été possibles sans les efforts déployés partout à l'échelle du pays. Although the number of COVID-19 cases continues to decline across the country, we cannot be sure that the danger has passed, as Dr. New just suggested. We must be prepared for a potential second wave of the virus. And that is why my department continues to adhere to a two-pronged contractual approach of buying aggressively in highly competitive global markets, while at the same time diversifying our supply chains, including in terms of domestic production. Now for an update on international shipments. This week, an additional nine cargo planes chartered by Canada brought home much-needed supplies, such as gloves, gowns, and masks. 
This brings our total to 78 plane loads of supplies received to date. We also welcomed our 13th shipment of hand sanitizer at the port of Vancouver, and we continue to receive about half a million N95 respirator masks from 3M in the United States on a monthly basis. This is in addition to the larger order that 3M is delivering directly to provincial and territorial health care systems. Les entreprises canadiennes maintenant. En plus des livraisons provenant de l'étranger, les entreprises canadiennes continuent de répondre aux besoins et d'aider le Canada à lutter contre la pandémie tout en créant et en protégeant des emplois partout au pays. Les entreprises dirigées par des groupes traditionnellement sous-représentés font partie intégrante de notre réponse de la COVID-19 et elles répondent à l'appel pour fournir des marchandises au Canada. For example, the Spirit Healthcare Group of Indigenous-led companies in Manitoba is an excellent illustration. In early March, Spirit Healthcare sourced and then delivered essential PPE for Manitoba's First Nations. The group's pharmacy and medical supply company, Spirit RX, then ramped up delivery of PPE to meet both provincial and territorial um, and federal requests. Spirit RX provided one million isolation gowns for the province of Manitoba and provided the federal government with more than 656 digital thermometers. We must and will continue to engage with Indigenous-led businesses. This objective is precisely the intention behind our recent request for proposals aimed at specifically Indigenous businesses for the provision of 25 million non-medical masks. That request for a proposal closes today. The response has been encouraging and we will have more to say on new contracts in the coming weeks. Maintenant, les livraisons. Les fournisseurs livrent la marchandise de toutes parts et les entreprises canadiennes jouent un rôle crucial dans nos efforts pour obtenir les équipements de protection individuelle les plus essentiels. Nous avons maintenant reçu plus de 205 millions d'unités de divers articles d'équipements de protection individuelle. Cela comprend des millions de blouses médicales, d'écrans faciaux, de gants, de masques, chirurgicaux et de respirateurs N95. Bon nombre de ces articles sont produits ici même au Canada par des fabricants canadiens. And now for our weekly PPE update. Gowns. To date, we have received a total of 4.9 million gowns with about half of them made in Canada. Face shields. We have also received a total of nearly 18 million face shields, and the vast majority of these are made right here at home. Hand sanitizer. We now have more than 7 million liters of hand sanitizer, and most of it was made right here in Canada as well. Masks and N95 respirators. We also have nearly 111 million surgical masks delivered with more on the way, and we continue to receive shipments of much sought after N95 respirators. In the coming weeks, these deliveries will include Canadian made N95s as part of our 10 year agreement with Medicom to manufacture and deliver on a monthly basis. We will be prepared for any eventuality. To date, our government has distributed some 3.5 million N95s and equivalent masks across the country. This week, I'm also pleased to report that after receiving Health Canada certification, CAE is set to start shipping Made in Canada ventilators every week to the Government of Canada. That company, based in Montreal and primarily focused on civil aviation and defense, was able to retool, recalling its employees from temporary layoff after being awarded a contract for the production of ventilators. Now it joins other Canadian manufacturers, such as Thornhill Medical, that are providing us with these life-saving Canadian-made machines. Now for an announcement. 
From the significant deliveries of PPE that Canada has received, it is clear that we have succeeded in securing contracts with a wide range of suppliers. As we move into the next phase of our response to the crisis, we are returning to the use of competitive processes where circumstances permit the longer timelines required to conduct a competition. I'm happy to announce that this week, after publicly soliciting proposals from Canadian suppliers, we have signed four contracts for cloth face masks. One of these contracts includes an agreement with Westport Manufacturing, which will be making these masks in its plants in Vancouver and Mississauga. Westport is another example of Canadian companies meeting the challenge of our time. After nearly 75 years of producing custom drapes and beddings, the company is pivoting its business to align with the demand for PPE at present in this country. In so doing, it is not only providing Canada with domestically manufactured masks, but also maintaining jobs in two Canadian cities. In closing, Canadians should know that as we move forward into the next phases of the pandemic and face a potential second wave, the Government of Canada is prepared. We are working with other levels of government and our industry partners to ensure that frontline workers have access to PPE needed to fight the pandemic. Global demand for PPE and medical supplies will continue to go up, and as it does, Canada will continue to keep up. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Anita, et j'inviterai maintenant Navdeep à prendre la parole. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Yves. Uh, and as we've been doing on a weekly basis, I'd like to share an update on our efforts to put into place a secure domestic supply of key personal protective equipment for our frontline healthcare workers. We're bringing together Canadian ingenuity and expertise to come up with homegrown solutions to the challenges that we are facing today. To date, over 6,400 Canadian firms have offered their expertise and capacity to retooling, scaling up, providing urgently needed goods and services. And I cannot say enough of how proud I am of our incredible Canadian innovative businesses and the work that they're doing during this challenging time. A few weeks ago, we put out a call under the Innovative Solutions Canada program. And this time, through the prototype stream, where departments right across government can test existing prototypes for both medical and non-medical solutions. And we've asked for creative Made in Canada technologies to address the COVID-19 pandemic and similar public health emergencies. And the response has been absolutely outstanding. En seulement deux semaines, nous avons reçu plus de 550 soumissions d'innovateurs partout au pays. And one of those companies, is Lind Equipment, based in Markham, Ontario, to which we have now awarded a contract under the Innovative Solutions Canada prototype testing stream. They're developing a UV sanitizer innovation called Apollo Light, using lead-generated UVC light capable of decontaminating work areas and surfaces and can potentially enable us to reuse personal protective equipment. There is promising science that indicates that UVC light can inactivate bacteria and viruses, including coronaviruses like SARS. And to move the project forward, we will be piloting the Apollo Light in CERN office and workspaces in Global Affairs Canada's head office in Ottawa. Nous allons mettre à laisser l'Apollo Light dans deux lieux de travail à l'administration centrale d'Affaires mondiales Canada à Ottawa. If successful, the light could be workplace as well as vehicles such as trains, buses, police, ambulance, and fire trucks. The next generation manufacturing supercluster has also selected several projects to support the fight against COVID-19. Le premier projet est celui de Exacad de Bois Brun au Québec. L'entreprise va fabriquer dans des moules pour produire les composantes en plastique utilisées dans les tests. 
And next is, is a project led by Cloud Diagnostics based in Kitchener. They make wrist cuffs that can remotely monitor a patient's pulse and other symptoms. And this technology can free up much needed hospital beds by sending non-urgent patients home while still being able to monitor how they're doing on a daily basis. Last is Mayant. It's out of Etobicoke and it's producing a new textile-based monitoring system for patients and frontline healthcare workers. Their smart garment technology has the ability to read and collect biometrics from the user's body via sensors, which are then analyzed by Mayan's AI platform to, uh, to essentially identify signs of health issues. And this and these initiatives add to the overall 37 COVID-19 response projects announced to date by our digital technology, next generation technology, and scale AI super clusters. I just like to close today by saying to everyone that has been contributing to uh, our efforts over the past few months, and I'm talking about our researchers, our entrepreneurs, our businesses, both large and small, we are sincerely grateful for your efforts. And today's announcements are further proof of your commitment to Canadians. And I know we share the goals of protecting Canadians now as we look to gradually reopening up the economy. So it's so heartening to see so many Canadians pulling together to achieve these goals. Once again, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, uh, Navdi. And we would all be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Minister. So as usual, we're going to start with three questions on the phone before we turn to the room. One question, one follow-up. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Our first question, the première question, we have Micheline Laflamme with Radio-Canada. Please go ahead. Have the parole. Oui, bonjour. Monsieur Duclos, j'aimerais aborder la question de, de la lettre que Maître Brian Greenspan a écrite au, au ministère de la Justice là, pour, euh, en ce qui concerne l'emprisonnement des deux Michael en Chine. Euh, Est-ce que, en fait, vous avez Louise Argo, vous avez Alan Rock, donc deux juristes, un ancien membre d'un cabinet, qui disent aussi que le gouvernement n'a pas à attendre la fin des procédures d'extradition pour, pour, pour euh, faire quoi que ce soit. Il pourrait décider dès maintenant euh, de, de ne pas poursuivre cette, extra, cette extradition-là et puis euh, si ça pouvait mener à la libération des deux Michael. Est-ce que ça, ça pourrait changer votre stratégie? Est-ce que, est que vous, dans l'avenir, est-ce que vous pouvez en, que vous en discuter? Merci pour la question et j'espère que vous m'entendez parce qu'il y a un petit enjeu technique, je crois. Il y a deux choses très importantes ici. La première, c'est que nous sommes évidemment très inquiets de la situation des deux Michael. Nous regrettons et nous sommes très fâchés par la situation que ces deux Michael vivent depuis trop longtemps maintenant en Chine pour toutes sortes de, de raisons. La situation... Euh, extraordinairement euh, injuste qu'ils vivent de par, par exemple, leur incapacité d'avoir des services consulaires, ce qui est totalement contre les ententes internationales. Donc, euh, nous sommes euh, fâchés, nous sommes inquiets de cette, cette situation et nous trouvons à la fois injuste et incorrect le traitement de la Chine à cet égard. La deuxième chose, c'est qu'au Canada, on fonctionne sur la base de l'intégrité et du respect euh, du système euh, judiciaire. Et c'est pour ça que M. Trudeau, hier, a rappelé à nouveau que nous allons euh, continuer euh, de travailler sur la base de l'indépendance, de l'intégrité et du système euh, judiciaire euh, au Canada, parce que non seulement ça fait la force de nos institutions et de notre pays, mais ça maintient aussi la réputation du Canada à l'extérieur des frontières et la capacité de nos partenaires partout dans le monde de nous appuyer sur cet enjeu avec la Chine. Oui, mais à, Michel, à juste, cela, Michel, euh, juste un petit instant, M. Duclos, si vous pouviez répéter en anglais d'abord, s'il vous plaît. So there are two important things in this uh, very unfortunate situation. The first thing is that we are uh, very preoccupied and, and saddened and angered by the uh, current situation which is affecting the two Michaels. We find it very unfortunate 
unfair and counterproductive for for China to to treat the two Michaels in that particular manner. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, of, of things that we don't understand, including the fact that they don't have access to consular services, which is an absolute obligation under international treaties. So we are making that well understood and well felt by the Chinese government. At the same time, we in Canada are used to and proud of the independence and the integrity and the respect for our judicial system, and we'll continue to do that, because not only is it important for Canadians and Canadian institutions to, to function and to prosper, but it's also important for the reputation of Canada outside of its frontiers, and in particular for the ability of Canada to draw the support that it has drawn from in the last few days in telling China that Canadians, Canada and many other countries across the world find this situation totally unacceptable. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. Micheline, en suivi. Mais de l'avis de Maître Greenspan, de l'avis de Mme Louise Arbour, qui est une ancienne euh, juge à la Cour suprême, en fait, je n'ai pas besoin de, de vous le décrire, là, euh, ils disent que le, le ministre de la Justice a l'autorité. Et donc, est-ce est que ce n'est pas le moment d'avoir ce genre de débat-là pour voir jusqu'où on pourrait aller? Mais on est évidemment euh, dans une société libre où tous les gens peuvent exprimer leur opinion. C'est non seulement possible, mais c'est souhaitable aussi que des gens expriment leurs opinions sur, sur la situation. Mais le Premier ministre Trudeau, toutefois, a été clair hier que nous allons suivre les, les, les modes appropriés de travailler au Canada sur la base à nouveau, à nouveau de l'intégrité, euh, du respect et de la réputation du système judiciaire à la fois au sein du pays et en dehors des frontières. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, nous vient de Jordan Press with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Ouvrez la parole. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my first question is for Minister Nan. Can you just explain, in moving back to this competitive bid process, where is going to be the line between what supplies are going to be subject to that bid process, or that competitive process, and which supplies are, no, are not going to be part of that because they're deemed more essential than others? Anita, we don't hear you. You might want to turn your microphone. Yes, it's on. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, there is not one single firm line between the decision to move to competitive bid processes versus sole sourcing. The decision regarding sole sourcing has been um, made under our emergency authorities. Um, given the crisis that we are in and the urgent need to source PPE and other items. And that urgency, in light of global demand and the fragility of international supply chains, continues to exist. Where possible, we are moving to competitive bid processes as a means to supplement our current supply chains. And as I have said repeatedly, our strategy is to have multiple supply chains operating in tandem so that we are able to procure PPE from diverse sources. And so the competitive bid process is a supplement to our current procurements. And as we have more stability in global supply chains for masks, gowns, gloves, and the like, we will be moving to competitive processes. Jordan, follow up. No, thank you for that. Uh, as a, a follow-up, actually, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Tam a question, and I'm sorry to throw a change up here to you, Doctor, but I'd like to ask about uh, the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, they are supposed to start uh, training as soon as, I believe, it's July 1st under the Major League Baseball's proposal that was unveiled yesterday. And I'm, I'm just curious, given some of the proposals that we've had with the NHL, can you just talk about whether the Blue Jays would actually be able to train in Toronto with the 14-day quarantine period? And, and if so, do you foresee any way for actually Major League Baseball games to be played in Toronto this year, considering the visiting teams would all be coming from the United States? 
So I think um, we've had discussions with essentially uh, all the key professional um, international leagues and including um, Major League Baseball. And I think um, it's predicated, of course, on a actual mitigation plan that ensures the safety of Canadians and, of course, for the league itself, the safety of its players. So I think similarly uh, with the NHL, um, those plans have to be um, essentially um, supported by local and provincial public health authorities. When players come in to, let's say, it's a bit like coming back to work in Toronto, where you come back to training, um, they are subjected to 14 days of, um, uh, of quarantine. Um, as the, the way that I understand it anyways, um, so individual training, etc., in Toronto, if you're first coming in, but as the teams co coalesce and come together, uh, there are the concepts of uh, cohorting uh, or group quarantine, uh, whereby the players have to remain together and, of course, uh, pose no risk to themselves or the surrounding uh, population. So that's that's the concept. Again, everything has to be reviewed. That There's a strict sort of testing and uh, screening and isolation and quarantine uh, requirements. And so, um, you know, routine testing is part of the, the sort of mitigation plan. But all of that has to be evaluated in real time as well. And uh, the local health authorities have to be comfortable with being engaged on what will happen if, say, there is a player that is tested positive. So that uh, requires the local public health uh, support for those protocols. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, the prochain question is from Michel Lamarche avec TVA. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Oui, bonjour. C'est une question pour euh, Monsieur Duclos. Monsieur Duclos, j'aimerais vous entendre sur euh, les plus récents chiffres du directeur parlementaire du budget sur l'évaluation des coûts pour la prolongation de la PCU, euh, qu'il calcule à environ le 18 milliards de dollars supplémentaires. J'aimerais savoir si ça vous a surpris. J'aimerais aussi savoir si vous êtes déçu de voir que la subvention salariale euh, ne prend pas d'élan au moment où on se parle et n'est pas aussi populaire que ce que vous escomptiez ou souhaitiez. Merci beaucoup pour la question. La première chose que je dirais, c'est qu'on est toujours très heureux du travail du directeur parlementaire du budget. Ils ont euh, non seulement euh, une capacité, mais une obligation de nourrir le gouvernement canadien et certainement les Canadiens d'informations euh, qu'eux peuvent euh, fournir. Et, mais comme le directeur parlementaire du budget le dit, le dit lui-même et comme son équipe le reconnaît, ce sont des informations euh, entouré d'une grande marge d'erreur. Et la marge d'erreur est explicable, entre autres, par le fait que la situation économique évolue rapidement depuis euh, quelques semaines. On voit un retour en emploi euh, assez rapide, euh, dans certaines régions en particulier, dont le Québec, euh, par exemple. Et donc, euh, on, on, on reçoit ces informations. Et comme on le sait, ces informations vont être utilisées par le ministre des Finances, qui lui-même va déposer le 8 juillet prochain, un portrait de la situation à la fois économique globale, mais aussi euh, fiscale euh, pour le gouvernement euh, canadien. Donc, des coûts qui sont, euh, qui sont estimés, euh, mais qui sont euh, entourés d'une marge d'imprécision importante en ce moment. On va, euh, d'ailleurs, dans, dans les prochains jours, peut-être même dans les prochaines heures, avoir des estimés séparés euh, du gouvernement canadien en matière du coût de la prestation canadienne d'urgence que l'on pourra comparer avec les, les statistiques du directeur parlementaire du budget. En ce qui a trait à la subvention salariale, on sait que ça a démarré lentement parce que c'était euh, un programme nouveau à la fois pour le gouvernement et pour les entreprises, mais on sait aussi que euh, l'impact de cette subvention s'accélère et on sait aussi que le ministre des Finances a annoncé un, à la fois un prolongement euh, au cours des, des prochaines semaines jusqu'au 29 août, mais aussi a annoncé que cette subvention allait prendre de plus en plus de place pour le retour et la relance. Michel, on suivi. 
Bien sûr, j'aimerais vous entendre sur les données de la SCHL et les prévisions qui ont été rendues disponibles un peu plus tôt aujourd'hui. On nous parle notamment d'un important recul des mises en chantier pour le marché montréalais là, pour l'année 2020. Peut-être un rebond par la suite, mais devant tous ces chiffres et les gros marchés au pays, est-ce que vous avez des inquiétudes majeures par rapport au, au marché de, de l'immobilier? Est-ce que ces prévisions et ces données euh, vous inquiètent? Je dirais que, je, personnellement, je suis plutôt euh, confiant et j'ai particulièrement confiance dans les, euh, dans les travaux de la Société canadienne d'hypothèque et de logement, de la SCHL. Les deux mots-clés ici, c'est, euh, je dirais, confinement et à nouveau confiance. Le, le confinement euh, au Québec et à Montréal en particulier, au cours des dernières semaines, a fait mal euh, à l'économie, mais c'était nécessaire pour des raisons sanitaires. Euh, le confinement a inclus au début le confinement de l'industrie de la construction, donc il est un petit peu normal que cette industrie ait pris un certain retard. Par contre, j'ai beaucoup confiance pour la suite, et en particulier à Montréal, parce qu'on avait partout au Québec et à Montréal en particulier une excellente situation économique avant la crise de la COVID-19. On avait essentiellement le plein emploi partout au Québec et la, la, la force de l'économie québécoise, c'est une force qui est, qui est solide et euh, avec... Euh, tout ce que je vois et tout ce que je sens en termes de, de relance au Québec, avec aussi des atouts que nous avons euh, au Québec, plus particulièrement en matière d'innovation, de, 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 en matière d'investissement dans les nouvelles technologies, en matière d'investissement dans les infrastructures, particulièrement dans la région de Québec. Moi, j'ai confiance que le marché de l'immobilier va, comme la SCHL le laisse entendre, va euh, rebondir assez rapidement. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. We will now turn to the room, starting with David from CBC. Hi, everyone. Um, we've seen a considerable rise in coronavirus cases in the United States. And as you said, Dr. Tam, a lot of the infections we're seeing are in the Americas. Um, so is the government considering any more testing, tracing, or any additional measures for people who are allowed to cross the border? You know, I'm thinking about truckers, people en route to Alaska, that kind of thing. So right now, um, the key, um, you know, there's a series of measures, of course, that are, um, uh, apply to um, persons traveling, traveling to Canada. And you've heard some of these from Transport Canada in terms of for flights, for example, screening ahead of the flight, temperature check, arrival screening questions um, and the mandatory 14-day quarantine uh, for with sort of certain exemptions. And people who are truck drivers are providing essential services, so they're not uh, asked to uh, uh, be mandated for 14 days of um, isolation uh, or quarantine, uh, but they are asked to um, stick to the uh, intent of the quarantine measures, which is don't come in contact with, you know, physical distancing, mask wearing if you're not um, able to keep that distance, etc. So at the moment, um, testing is not part of the border uh, measures. Um, given some of the characteristics of the tests, uh, immunity, for example, is not yet well characterized, for example. So relying on antibody testing at this time Uh, is not um, um, being entertained until we've got more information about human immunology and the performance of the serologic testing. That's the antibody testing. Testing for the virus itself through PCR testing, that's a different test, can only um, you know, ascertain whether someone is infected at that moment in time. And, and, and even during the course of illness, they may test negative. Uh, even if they're infected uh, for the initial period of the incubation period. So there are limitations, of course, to lab testing. Um, but we're continuing to e evaluate the performance and look at all different possibilities of uh, adding more and more layers of uh, measures if, uh, if we are to increase traffic across um, uh, Canada. So um, I think uh, we're, you know, continuously evaluating, but at this point in time, um, that is not part of our measures. Okay, thank you. Um, and I also just want to ask you about 
what is the evidence? Maybe you could explain to us the evidence that you're using that you're using to recommend that people stay two meters apart. And do you think that provinces and territories should consider reducing the that recommended distance to maybe one meter? We're seeing other countries do do that. So um yeah, there are different sort of recommendations by different countries. We see the suite of recommendations, the core public health measures for members of the public as very much layers of protection. So, and the two meter distance is based on the, the usual um, sort of way droplets that are emitted from people if they're coughing or sneezing, etc., cetera, uh, fall to the ground or fall on top of someone else. And so, um, you know, you may catch the majority of droplets within one meter, but there are droplets that are going to fall between one to two meters. So what you're looking at is layers of precaution. And if you can't keep the two meters, we recommend the masks, etc. always wash your hands. Don't go out and intermingle if you're sick. All of those still has to apply. But there are layers of protection under certain circumstances. Maybe people can't keep the exact two meter distance, but but we absolutely recommend that all of those layers of protection are, are provided. Um, but I know that provinces have to adjust to certain realities of maintaining the distance. But that's the, the bottom line is that, you know, one meter catches a whole bunch of droplets, two meters, there will be more uh, droplets that you, you may be able to avoid if you kept the two meter distance. So that's the basis of the recommendations. And uh, again, you know, we'll, we'll undergo continuous discussion with the chief medical officers around Canada. But at the last discussion, which was only last week, we agreed that two meters is what we want to recommend for Canadians. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Kelsey. Um, thank you. My questions are for Minister Baines. Um, two years ago, you announced a fast track visa program aimed at luring high skilled workers to Canada called the Global Talent Stream. Yesterday, President Trump said that he was temporarily blocking visas for such highly skilled foreign workers. And today, the CEO of Shopify has already issued an invitation on Twitter for high skilled engineers and that to consider working in Canada. So I'm wondering how much of an opportunity is President Trump's decision to temporarily block these visas for Canada? And are you looking to plan? Are you planning on expanding or extending the global talent stream program in light of the changes announced by Washington? Well, thank you very much uh, for your question. Uh, you're absolutely correct in your assessment, which is uh, we as a government launched this global skills strategy to attract top tier global talent. Uh, we've seen in the past that every visa that we've issued, it's also helped create Canadian jobs. Roughly 10 Canadian jobs were created for every visa that was issued. So this helped uh, with the expansion of our economy. This helped so many businesses, small and large, uh, businesses uh, grow and scale up. And so this has been a very positive development for our economy. And we fundamentally uh, believe in immigration, progressive immigration policies. Uh, we believe that if we have strong immigration policies coupled with strong domestic policies around lifelong learning, that we equip Canadians to succeed, to get better outcomes, better jobs, and better opportunities moving forward. Uh, we're very mindful that we need to focus on our strategies. We know different countries, the U.S., as you highlighted, will pursue their own paths when it comes to immigration. Uh, but we fundamentally believe that we're in a unique position to attract top-tier talent. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of international students as well in our academic institutions. And so overall, we're going to continue down that path. Uh, with regards to the Global Skills Strategy Program that you mentioned, that is a permanent feature. Uh, that is something that was a pilot project that we launched a few years ago, and now it's a permanent part of our immigration policy. And I look forward to working with my colleague, Marco Mandicino, to see what further changes we can bring about to attract top-tier global talent here to Canada, which will help create Canadian jobs and create economic growth here in Canada. Um, so given Canada's unique position and the latest changes announced by Washington then, is Canada planning on doing a campaign to attract this talent to, to Canada given, given this possibility? Again, I underscore one key component of our industrial policy called the Innovation and Skills Plan. 
we know now that even if the investments that we're making, for example, in the Made in Canada project, are really predicated on investing in people, investing in their ideas, and we recognize that immigration is going to be a critical component of generating those ideas because when new people come here, they come here to succeed. They come here to do better. Uh, and that creates opportunities for us here in Canada, as I said. And so I think there's tremendous opportunities for us to reevaluate our immigration policies and continue to build on the successes of the past. And I look forward to working with my colleague to examine the opportunities that we have because we want to move forward uh, with a strong uh, recovery uh, for the economy. And we know immigration is going to be front and center for that. Thank you, Minister. Molly? Hi, Doctors and Ministers. Molly Thomas, CTV National News. Uh, Minister Duclos, is Canada bracing for a 10% tariff on aluminum products to the U.S.? And can you help us understand what you're hearing from the U.S. counterparts on this subject? Uh, thank you very much for that question. And uh, I would first start with two uh, brief uh, remarks. The first one is that we will always defend the interest of the 11,000 aluminum workers that uh, we have the chance of having across uh, Canada working very hard in a very competitive industry. The second thing is that Minister Freeland is on top of this file. She has uh, advocated, as we all know, very uh, hard and very well over the last years uh, advocated the interest for the interest of those workers with our American uh, neighbor. What I would also add is that uh, a bit more than a year ago, on the 17th of May 2019, the U.S. administration agreed to lift the unfair and illegal uh, tariffs on aluminum that had been imposed under their Section 232. Now, with that came a commitment by the Canadian government to put into place better regulations and better monitoring um, rules and, uh, and resources to ensure that aluminum uh, would not be dumped into Canada. That was put into effect on the 1st of September 2019. And since then, we have not only uh, respected our commitment, but have indeed, with uh, uh, our business partners, partners, made sure that those regulations and that those uh, resources would be there to protect against uh, uh, aluminum dumped from abroad. Now, uh, I will also add that in a few days from now, on July the 1st, the new NAFTA will enter into force, which reinforces even more uh, the uh, interest of Canada and the United States to work together, because under that agreement, there is a minimum of 70 percent of a minimum that must be used within uh, North America to produce, uh, to, be, to be used in the automotive uh, industry. And that uh, also means that these, uh, the, the use and the production of aluminum in Canada is no harm and no threat to our American uh, friends and, and neighbors. It's, in fact, uh, the free flow of aluminum across our border is a, a mutual benefit to both uh, both countries and and workers in both uh, in, in both countries. It makes our businesses more competitive, in particular in the automobile industry. It also reduces uh, costs to consumers. When we have a more competitive industry, it, it's also good for for consumers. And I would also add that uh, strategic reasons make it very important for that flow of aluminum to be uh, to be managed appropriately. Uh, much of our aluminum is provided to uh, critical industries in the U.S., including the defense and the airspace industry. And that's one more reason to let our American friends and neighbors understand that we, uh, we need to keep uh, working together to ensure that uh, this uh, uh, stays as it has done in the last few months in a collaborative and efficient manner. En français, s'il vous plaît, Monsieur le Ministre. Euh, donc, ce que, ce que je dois tout d'abord dire, c'est que le gouvernement canadien va toujours défendre les intérêts des 11 000 travailleurs en aluminium que l'on retrouve partout au pays, et en particulier juste euh, au nord de ma, ma circonscription, dans la région du euh, Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, euh, parce que ces 11 000 travailleurs travaillent à tous les jours dans une industrie extraordinairement compétitive et très importante pour beaucoup d'autres secteurs de notre économie. La deuxième chose, c'est que Mme Freeland a travaillé sur cet enjeu de manière 
acharnée et extraordinairement efficace au cours des dernières années et elle continue à le faire encore euh, aujourd'hui. Je devrais ajouter que l'accord qui a été signé il y a à peu près un an, le 17 mai 2019, est un accord qui euh, éliminait ces euh, tarifs sur l'aluminium imposés de manière à la fois injuste et illégale par l'administration américaine, mais qui engageait aussi le gouvernement canadien à mettre en place des règlements plus solides et des manières de s'assurer que ces règlements étaient plus euh, clairement et plus efficacement appliqués, entre autres par l'Agence de la sécurité frontière, frontière, frontalière du gouvernement euh, canadien, pour s'assurer qu'il n'y avait pas de « dumping » de pays étrangers euh, au Canada. Ces, euh, ces règlements et ces ressources ont été mis en place à partir du 1er septembre dernier, ce qui fait en sorte que nous avons respecté nos, nos, nos engagements et que nous avons mis en place un système qui permet, encore plus qu'avant, libre, la libre circulation de l'aluminium. Ceci étant dit, euh, cette libre cir circulation de l'aluminium est encore plus importante avec la mise en place, dans quelques jours à peine, le 1er juillet, du nouvel ALENA, qui garantit, entre autres choses, que 70 de l'aluminium utilisé dans l'industrie automobile euh, entre les trois pays que sont le Mexique, les États-Unis et le Canada, cet aluminium, à 70 doit venir des trois pays. Donc, encore une raison additionnelle de s'assurer que cette libre circulation de l'aluminium euh, continue. Mais c'est vrai aussi que cette libre circulation de l'aluminium est bonne pour la, la compétitivité des industries euh, variées euh, dans les deux pays, en particulier pour l'industrie de l'aérospatiale et l'industrie de l'automobile. C'est bon pour les entreprises, c'est bon pour les travailleurs, c'est bon aussi pour les consommateurs qui paient des prix moins élevés et que nous allons donc continuer à faire entendre notre point de vue à, à l'administration américaine pour s'assurer que cette bonne euh, relation que nous avons depuis plusieurs mois puisse continuer. Molly, follow-up. Uh, Minister Duclos, uh, on a se separate subject, you know that there are credible legal voices saying the government can intervene in the Meng Wanzhou case. How many years are we willing to let this drag through the courts here in Canada? Well, we... We understand and we feel and, and, and we not only share, but are very upset uh, with what uh, the, with the situation that the two uh, Michaels are going through in China for too long. We have, and the Prime Minister has made that very clear once again yesterday, we have let the Chinese government that this is totally unacceptable. And we believe that our anger and frustration are also shared by many other partners outside of Canada, and some of them have voiced also their, uh, their, their, the level of, uh, of, of anger and, and, and frustration. And I think this is uh, something absolutely essential. Now, this being said, in Canada, we have not only a tradition, but a responsibility to work uh, in a manner that is supportive of the integrity Uh, and the independence of our justice system. This is, uh, this is very important uh, for the way in which our institutions work in Canada. We have a, a separation between the executive the, um, and the, le the le legislative as well as the judicial systems, and that's exactly what it should be. We also have a, a reputation uh, to defend outside of our borders if we want to maintain the ability of other partners to defend us in those very uh, uh, upsetting circumstances that the, Mike, the two Michaels are living through. Thank you, Minister. We'll take one last question on the phone and one last question from the room, but we'll start on the phone. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, the prochaine question, vient de Emily Bergeron avec l'agence CUNY. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Oui, bonjour, M. Duclos. Euh, sur euh, cette euh, possibilité de, de, de retour de tarifs euh, sur l'aluminium, euh, vous êtes prêt euh, aujourd'hui à, à réagir devant cette possibilité? Euh, un peu avant, il y a le bureau de la ministre Fulane qui nous a envoyé une déclaration prête aussi. Euh, Est-ce que c'est parce que la menace d'un retour de tarifs, elle est réelle? Qu'est-ce que vous entendez? Est-ce que ce que Bloomberg rapporte est vraiment euh, tangible? Bon, on, on connaît, on, on sait que depuis un certain temps, euh, les États-Unis euh, mettent en place non seulement des attitudes, mais des actions de protectionnisme 
euh, accentué. Ceci étant dit, nous avons pu, avec le travail, entre autres, de Mme Freeland et certainement celui aussi de M. Trudeau, nous avons pu, au cours des derniers mois et des dernières années, euh, faire face à la musique. Nous avons renouvelé, nous avons signé un nouvel accord euh, de l'ALENA. Euh, nous avons éliminé, il y a un peu plus d'un an, les tarifs qui étaient à l'époque imposés sur l'aluminium et sur euh, l'acier. Donc, nous avons, malgré cet environnement... Euh, complexe pu protéger les intérêts euh, des travailleurs euh, canadiens à plusieurs égards. Ceci étant dit, on ne se le cachera pas, la menace protectionniste, elle est toujours là et elle est probablement encore plus euh, grave euh, dans le contexte de l'insécurité économique et sanitaire que vivent beaucoup des pays à travers le monde. Donc, c'est une menace que l'on prend toujours euh, sérieusement. Et on doit régulièrement, comme on le fait encore aujourd'hui, rappeler à nos voisins et nos partenaires euh, économiques l'importance de travailler ensemble. Parce que c'est un... Lorsqu'on travaille ensemble et lorsqu'on s'écoute et lorsqu'on comprend que les règles sont appliquées correctement, bien, on permet à nos industries dans les pays concernés d'être davantage compétitives et prospères. So we... Uh, all uh, are aware of the uh, protectionist uh, attitudes and actions of the last few years in the context of our relationship with the United States. Um, we did, however, work really well, and that certainly is in large part due to the uh, work of Minister Freeland and Prime Minister Trudeau in addressing uh, those, uh, those threats from, in particular, our so southern Uh, neighbor, and we have uh, come to a new NAFTA. We've also lifted about a year ago the unfair and illegal uh, aluminum tariffs uh, and aluminum and steel tariffs that were imposed under their Section 232. This being said, we need as Canadians to be mindful of the fact that protectionism still exists and, in fact, uh, runs the risk of being even bigger and a, a being an even greater threat as we emerge from the COVID health and economic crisis. This being said, we use every opportunity to make our neighbors and friends and trade partners understand that it is to the joint benefit of everyone to keep the flow of goods and services uh, open and strong, because we all gain from that. Our businesses become and remain com more competitive if we succeed in decreasing the um, the barriers that could be imposed on their protectionist views. Emilie, en suivi. Oui, bien sûr. Euh, D'accord. Euh, J'essaie juste de comprendre. Euh, on, on comprend que la menace protectionniste n'est pas quelque chose de, de nouveau, euh, mais est-ce que vous êtes en mesure de confirmer aujourd'hui qu'il y a des... que cette considération-là au sein de l'administration Trump et qu'il y a vraiment cette possibilité euh, tangible que vendredi, il y aura une annonce en ce sens? Bien, il y a autour, dans toute administration et certainement dans tout pays, une diversité de points de vue. Et il, serait, il est tout à fait normal qu'au sein de l'administration d'un gouvernement voisin, qu'il y ait de temps en temps des voix qui, qui proposent euh, un, un retour vers le, le, pro, le protectionnisme. Alors, peu importe si ces voix sont effectivement euh, présentes et, et, et se manifestent, peu importe que ce soit le cas ou non, le gouvernement canadien a toujours l'obligation euh, de protéger, dans un esprit de précaution, de protéger les intérêts de ses travailleurs et de rappeler, dans tous les contextes possibles, l'importance de travailler, de continuer à travailler ensemble pour le bénéfice de nos, de nos industries, de nos entreprises et de nos travailleurs. Merci, M. le ministre. Last question, Mike. Um, Michael Couture from Global National. Minister Duclos, the question's for you. Um, if you say that the Canadian government has been monitoring the flow and making sure that there is no dumping of steel into Canada and, and then uh, thereby sort of angering the Americans, why is the U.S. talking about a 10% tariff on aluminum if Canada has supposed to be monitoring this? Thank you. The, uh, those monitoring and regulatory Uh, activities and resources have been put into place uh, starting September 1st, 2019. So a few months ago, they have been effective. 
And we, uh, being given that this is the case, uh, Minister Freeland and Prime Minister Trudeau uh, are using every opportunity and will keep doing so to, uh, to, uh, to engage with our American uh, partners to make sure that those, uh, the, the result and the positive result of those uh, regulations and activities are well understood by all um, um, involved partners in the U.S. But that's, that's a big, big, a large number of partners, and some of them may not have perhaps uh, fully um, followed the application and the usefulness of those, uh, those activities and resources. So if there is a level of, uh, of uncertainty, Minister Freeland and Prime Minister Trudeau will certainly make sure that, uh, that it is uh, at least clarified that we keep maintaining that ex excellent and mutually uh, positive and beneficial relationship that we've developed on that particular file over the last few months. Just as a follow-up, uh, the last time this happened, so one of the ways that the Canadian government responded was tariffs on American products to the tune of $16.6 billion. There was things such as Kentucky bourbon playing cards. If I'm not mistaken, you can correct me if I'm wrong, in the latest UMCA, USMCA, we don't seem to have that leverage because we're only allowed to impose tariffs on something on aluminum, in this case, if they apply them to Canada. So what kind of leverage do we have in trying to fight this possibility of 10 percent tariffs on aluminum if we don't have the ability to strike them back at other products? Do we have the ability to delay U.S. Uh, CS Cosmo or USMCA coming to effect before July 1st as leverage to prevent them from doing this to us? Well, the, the short answer to this question is that we will always defend the interests of aluminum workers using all the tools that are available. Now, the tools that we have now are very substantial. We have a new NAFTA, which is going to take effect in a few days from now, which is going to make it even more important that the flow of aluminum is maintained to continue building a stronger automobile industry on both sides of the borders. We have also a, 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 an enforcement mechanism, a monetary mechanism that is working really well, at which is, I believe, reassuring a large number of, of partners uh, on, in, in the U.S. And we'll continue to do exactly that, you know, to keep insisting on defending our workers while remembering and remi reminding everyone that it is, this is to the benefit of all workers uh, on both sides of the frontiers. And in doing this, we will always be uh, open to and certainly eventually be able to use all possible options. Thank you, Minister. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse. That's it for today. Thank you.